Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your goodness, Lord. It always, Lord, it always feels good to be in your house. Uh, Lord, I pray for anyone here who might be tired, Lord. Maybe they had a difficult week or even a difficult day, Lord God. Strengthen us. Remind us, Lord God, that you have us here for a reason, Lord God, that you desire us to know you more. And the way we know you more is, is through the word that you've given us, Lord. You have revealed yourself, your heart, your will, even your plan for our lives through your word. And so that's why we turn to it, Lord. That's why we believe every book is special, Lord. Every, every book, every word, every verse is important for our lives. And so open our hearts tonight as we always pray, Lord, speak to us. And help us to learn everything you desire us to learn tonight, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have a Bible this evening, which I hope you do, let's turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 10. Book of Ezra, chapter 10. Amen. Book of Ezra, chapter 10. Give you guys a few seconds to turn there. And so, amen. Uh, Again, part two, uh, I'll be giving a quick recap and and really cover what we covered last week in our part one. Uh, I purposely, I shared this last week, I had hoped to put chapters nine and 10 together because they really do go together. Uh, But it was so much to cover that I had to break it up in two parts. And so uh, again, tonight's part two as we wrap up the book. And so uh, we'll be doing that in just a few minutes. Let me back up again, as I always do, and just kind of in a nutshell, remind Mind everybody uh, what this whole book has been about. This whole book has really been about the faithfulness of God, and I love it. God has been faithful, and, and the sad thing is, although man is not always faithful, right? Man is not always faithful. God is always faithful. God always keeps his word. God never breaks his promises. And the amazing thing, not only in this book, but even in all the books that we've covered uh, from Genesis all the way to Ezra, we have seen a similar story. And it's a story, again, we should be familiar with, that despite the fact that man fails, God never fails. Amen? God always takes care of his kids, and I love it. God always, and I, I mean always, provides us what we need. And, and we have seen, again, in this book, That despite the fact that the children of Israel were disobedient, right, and they got themselves kicked out of the promised land, and they found themselves in exile, right, in Babylon, in this ungodly place for 70 years, God never gave up on his kids. And God, again, in his mercy, although he didn't have to, he used ungodly kings. First, he used Cyrus, the king of Persia, right, to allow this first group, after the 70 years were complete, Uh, This first group headed back, right, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and they returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Almost 50,000 people returned. Then, as we've almost, again, got to the end of this book, we saw a second group return, this time under the leadership of Ezra. It wasn't 50,000, it was somewhere more like 5,000, but it was still another group who was allowed to return, this time not by Cyrus, this was 80 years later, this was by Cyrus's grandson by the name of King Artaxerxes. Again, once again, we saw God's faithfulness, right? And not giving up on his kids that were not faithful to him, but still reaching out and being good and providing again us a second chance to serve him. Now, the awesome thing that we saw is in chapter 7, we were introduced to Ezra. He was absent from the first six chapters, even though, again, we know he, uh, he wrote the book. And we learned something special about this man. We learned that God raised this man up. And I, I truly believe as we look at history, even as we look at our own lives, I believe that God is working on many levels. And I believe God is working in different people's lives, orchestrating his plan, right, for our good. I love this. And God was doing something special with Ezra. What did we learn about Ezra? A couple things quickly. One, he had descended from the line of Aaron. And that was very important to know. Aaron was, again, Moses' brother, all the way back to the, to the beginning, right? Moses' brother. He was the first high priest. He was the original high priest, and only descendants from his line were able to serve as high priests in the temple. So that was very special, okay? There was no coincidence. This told us that had Ezra been born in Jerusalem where the temple was, he would have likely been in line, if not already been, the high priest of Israel. 
but because he was born in Babylon. He was not born where the temple was. He could not function as a priest. So what did he do? And this was important. Even though he could not do what he believed God desired him to do, he prepared his life. What a lesson for all of us, right? He prepared his life believing that one day God would take him to Jerusalem where he would be able to do what God desired him to do. And this is awesome because the name Ezra means, you guys remember, helper. It means helper. Get this. I'll throw this out there for free, right? Nehemiah's name means comforter, okay? Now, what do we call the Holy Spirit? He is the helper and he is the comforter. Again, beautiful lessons. Remember this because we'll be getting into the book of Nehemiah again after, after Ezra. But we see again how God used these men right? Ezra, and then later on again, Nehemiah to help the people of God, to lead the people of God back to him. Now, if you were with us, Ezra, we read, came to Jerusalem. He brings that 5,000, and he comes, and he's excited. His whole life had been spent preparing himself to help the people of God, to live up to the name that he had been given, helper. And we saw something very interesting. And again, if you weren't with us, I'm going to get into it, but something very special. We saw tragically last week that after 80 years, that first group who had returned to Jerusalem the first time fell into sin. What a sad story that we keep hearing over and over again, right? They repent and then they fall back into sin and they repent and they fall back into sin. And this is the history. This is the history of Israel, but it's the history of mankind. And so God had, get this, raised up Ezra to help bring his people back to him. And that's, again, the lesson of this whole book. Now, as we got into it last week, again, I want to look back quickly. Look at verse chapter 9, and I want to just touch on a couple things that we covered last week because they're very important in case you weren't with us, okay? The first thing we looked at, let me read verse 1. It says, after these things had been done, The officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands, and in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. Now I explained to you last week, there he is, I explained to you last week something very important. Ezra, we read, arrived back in Jerusalem. Remember, he is excited. He had never been to Jerusalem before. His whole life, he had dreamed about coming and worshiping at the temple, worshiping with God's people and teaching them God's word. Remember, he had studied his whole life to know the law of Moses. And sadly, we read, and this was important, that only after four months, he was only there four months as chapter, as verse one began, where he was teaching God's word, where he was, again, telling the people all that God desired of them. He was not only preaching, but he was practicing what he had preached. And in only four months, he had earned the respect of the people. The people, how many of you know, know when someone is real, Right? They knew that he was the real deal. They knew this guy had a heart and a love for God, and he was doing it right. And they admired that. And so they came to him, and they said, Ezra, we got to tell you something. Although you're teaching God's word, and we believe what you're teaching is true, we have to let you know that there's a lot of people here, even the leaders in our city, in our nation, they would say, that are in sin. Even the priests are in sin. Even the Levites are in sin. Even the singers are in sin. That's what it says. They ran it down to him that again, the people had turned back. What were they guilty of? Well, again, very importantly, they were guilty of intermarrying with the foreigners that lived around them. Remember, while they were gone, both the Assyrians and the Babylonians shipped people into the land of Israel to tend their crops, and so on and so forth. And so now the Jews come back, but they were ungodly people, and even mixed breeds, right, half Jewish, half, uh, you know, Canaanite or Perizzite, whatever it was, that were living in the land. And they began to marry them. 
they began to marry them. Now, this was, again, a no-no. We got into this in detail last week, but this is a clear violation of God's word according to Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. And I showed you the verse last week. Remember, this had nothing to do with race. This had nothing to do with the color of someone's skin. This had everything to do with marrying someone who does not worship the same God as you. And interesting, that still holds true today. Isn't that right? Why do you get so quiet? It still holds true today. Amen? Amen. This is true. Again, this is so true. Why is this important? Well, remember, we influence each other, don't we? We but rub off on each other. And so if we marry an unbeliever or someone, again, who does not serve the Lord or even have a desire to serve the Lord, as strong as we might be, we will be affected. We will be affected. Paul says, right, that he who takes, he thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. A lot of people say, well, but I'm strong. Well, I believe God's going to use me to, to, to pray, and, and I'm gonna, my life is going to bring them, and I'm going to help save them. Well, that's wishful thinking. How many of you know God doesn't need you to save somebody? Okay? God can do it. We need to obey God's word. We need to be careful. Remember the lesson of Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And he fell. How did he fall? Well, if you know his story, he married foreign ungodly women. And they took his heart away from God. And little by little over the years, he began to worship their false gods. And so again, what a lesson, what a powerful lesson. We talked about this in detail last week, but what I shared with you, real simply, is that we have to remember, (coughs) excuse me, that God called us out of the world. (coughs) Excuse me, isn't that right? God called us out of the world. He did not call us out of the world so that we can go back and found and find a spouse in the world. Does that make right? Make sense? God did not call us out of the world so that we can go back in the world and find a spouse there. But sadly, again, the people didn't listen, okay? And so if we look at verse 3 quickly. As soon as I heard this, right, he said, I tore my garment, my cloak, I pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. The word appalled means shocked. He was stunned. His whole life, he imagined that when he got to Jerusalem, He was going to worship the Lord with solid believers. That's not what happened. Here he comes and he's so shocked. He's disappointed. He's frustrated. Here he thought, again, everyone loved God like he did. Everyone was passionate about God's word like he was. Come to find out none of it was true. And so he's so mad. Can you imagine? He rips his clothes, right? He pulls out hair from his head. Pulls out hair from his beard. He's just, man, I can't believe it. Why was he upset? Again, we talked about this. Two important reasons. Number one, he was upset because he knows sin will always bring its consequences. Isn't that right? We will all reap what we sow. That's universal. That never changes. It never will change. And he knew it. In his mind, he's like, wait a minute. We got kicked out of the promised land for worshiping false gods. And now you're going to marry these ungodly women, eventually worship their false gods. You're going to get get us kicked out again. This was his thinking. And so he's mad. He can't believe it. He's like, I can't believe this. I mean, that's how we would say it. But there's a second reason why he was so upset. And I showed you this when I took you to Malachi chapter 2 last week. I showed you that God desires godly offspring. You guys remember that? What does that mean? That means that God desires his kids to have godly kids. Real simple. That's what God desires. God wants you to have godly offspring. That's what he wants. Malachi chapter 2.15. Look it up later. This is important for two reasons. Not only because that means there's more of his, his kids, but it also means that the next generation and the next generation, and the next generation continues to serve God. And that's what God desires. And so it's very important. Again, we covered all this last week. Very, very important. Now, specifically, and this is the specifics, in, Mount, in Ezra's case, 
Ezra was especially passionate about the next generation, and I told you why. Because every Jew knew that the coming Messiah was going to be born. Okay? They didn't know when, but they knew he was coming. The last thing they wanted was for the Jews to intermingle with ungodly people and turn away from God because had that happened, they were preventing the Messiah from being born. And so he's upset. He's upset. How could we do this? How could we turn away from God? And so what did he do? Which was the second thing we covered, right? We covered the sin being exposed. And the second thing last week was the prayer offered. And this is even really beautiful. In verses 5 through 15, we're not going to read it. We read that Ezra goes before the temple. Imagine him in front of the church. And he bows on his knees. And he opens his hands towards God. And he bows his head. And he begins to pray. And I love this. I shared with you, he did not go and rebuke those that were in sin. He did not point the finger. He did not do anything other than pray. He prayed. And understand how he prayed. It's important. He prayed at the door of the temple. Why would he do this? Well, get this. He knew that everyone was going to come to church that night. Okay? The Bible says during the time of the evening sacrifices, he went there. And can you imagine walking into church that day, and Ezra is there on his knees, hands lifted, head bowed, and he's crying out to God, and he's not, he's not doing this quietly. He's loud. He's open. He's heralding. He's confessing to God so that everyone could hear what he was praying. And if you take the time to read those prayer, to read his prayer through the end of the chapter, we will read, or you will read, that he was confessing how ashamed he was for their sin. He was acknowledging, God, we're without excuse. You have been nothing but good to us. Have mercy. And that's what his prayer was. And imagine how that felt as you were guilty of that sin and you walked into church just doing your religious thing and you heard Ezra praying what he was praying, okay? That's where we pick it up in chapter 10 as we look at the impact Ezra's prayer had on his people. Let's look at the action taken. Verse 1, chapter 10. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping, and casting himself down before the house of God, right in front of the house of God, the temple, a very great assembly of men and women and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. Okay? Now you have to imagine this, because this will really make it come real to you. Again, he's crying out. He's loud. He's crying, Lord, have mercy how could we do this, Lord? You have been nothing but good to us. You could have left us in Babylon, but yet you extended your grace. You called us out of the world. And this is all out loud. And yet we have sinned against you. You have been faithful, but we have been faithless. And all this is being said. And again, as the people coming to the temple, coming to churches, we would say, heard his prayer, heard him declare the truth of what took place. Their hearts were convicted. And do we know what it's like to feel conviction, right? This is, what, this is that picture. The same thing that happens when we hear someone declare God's truth, right? And we are convicted. What is it? That's the Holy Spirit convicting our lives, reminding us that we have erred in the ways of God. And that error brings guilt, that we need, right? Guilt, a lot of people don't like guilt, but guilt is a good thing. I truly believe every backslider, I'll talk about a backslider, every backslider knows down deep inside that they need to get right with God. Would you agree with that? Down deep inside. They might not want to, but they know it. Down deep inside. And so this is the place. These people knew, they knew they were guilty, and they knew they needed to get right with God. And all of a sudden again, they hear this prayer and they're convicted. Now guess what? Remember, the leaders of the city had been involved in the sin. And so if we don't know for how many years it was just going on. No one said nothing. If the leaders were doing it, who could say anything? But now you finally had someone standing up, right? 
standing up in their heart, standing up for what is right, right? And crying out to God, exposing the sin of the people. And he was broken and he cared and it meant something. And again, the people were cut to the heart. So that, what does it say? They, this a very great assembly, and what does it say? A tremendous crowd now begins to break down. They begin to weep bitterly because they knew down deep inside that he was right. Now, I love this because, again, we've talked about this. What difference can one person make, right? What difference can one person make? One person can make a mighty difference, right? The Bible tells us, again, I love the verse, James 5.16, right? The effectant, fervent prayer of a righteous person, what? Accomplishes much. Not by might, nor by power, but, but by God's Spirit. But by God's Spirit, when we rely on God, when we truly take the time and believe God, God can get a hold of the unsaved person. God can get a hold of the backslider. God can do it again. It is through prayer. Now, of course, what does it say? It says, the effective, fervent prayer. That prayer, you need to care about what you pray about, right? Of a righteous person. This is not a person who's playing games but a person who really is living it, not perfectly, none of us are perfect, but truly trying to serve the Lord and being the example that we need to be and crying out on behalf of our loved one, on behalf of our friends, on behalf of our neighbors, on behalf of whoever it is that needs the prayer, praying that they would feel guilty. Have you ever prayed that God would cause someone to feel guilty? Because it's a good prayer. Understand that although no one likes to feel conviction, do we understand that unless we feel conviction, we will never change? Isn't that right? Unless we feel conviction, we will never change. What's so interesting, again, and one of the things that, that I, I think about, that I thought about, is it's interesting how a lot of people, and I've heard this many times, like to come to church to laugh. Do you guys know that? I have heard people say, well, I, I like going to that church over there because the pastor's funny. <laughs> I'm not funny, okay? I'll be the first to admit it, right? I'm probably on the more serious side. That's just my personality. That's the way God made me, okay? Sometimes I wish I was funny. I wish I was more funny. But do you understand that although it would be nice to laugh you know, we come to church and we just walk out of here with a big smile on our face and our stomach hurts because we laugh so hard. That would be nice. But that temporary mood that we leave with will soon be gone. Isn't that right? But if we come to church and really allow God to minister to us, maybe we feel guilt. Maybe we'll, we feel sorrow. But this is what will last. This will is what will last. James said something again, very powerful. James 4, 9 through 10, powerful verse, guys. He says, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is the verse. This is what God says. You know what you need, God says? You need to be broken. You need to feel sorrow over what you've done. That is what will change you. The laughs, again, they're nice, but they will do nothing for you tomorrow. What you need that will last is to be broken by God, to be sorrowful and feel guilty over the things that you have done. Why? Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul says, for godly sorrow... What does it say? Produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. I love that. Do you guys know that? Godly sorrow, when you're really broken, when you're really sorry for what you have done, that is what leads us to repentance. That is what will bring change to our life. So although, again, the laughs are nice, tears are better. Tears are better. Tears are better. And again, that's what the Bible teaches so what happened? Verse 2. Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, 
of the sons of Elam addressed Ezra. He says, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Here you have this man. Again, his name is Shechaniah. He hears the words that Ezra had prayed. And he sensed, again, that conviction. He felt the conviction as well. And he agreed. He agreed, again, with what Ezra had said. Now, what's interesting about this man, Shechaniah, is later on, at the end of the chapter, we read that Shechaniah actually never sinned. He was not one of the people, one of the many people that actually married a foreign wife. But get this, his dad had, and his dad's five brothers all had married foreign wives. They were all guilty. They were all in sin. And so because it hit so close to home, this man speaks up, leading the people to confess their sin to confess, to acknowledge that they have sinned against God, right? That they have sinned against God. Now, I love what it says. Notice what it says. He says, but even now there is hope for Israel, right? Even now there is hope for Israel. Now, think about it. Why, when you feel conviction, is there still hope? That's the question. Why is it when you feel conviction, is there still hope? And the reason is if you feel conviction, it means God is still speaking to you. Isn't that right? Isn't that a good thing? The scary thing is when you can sin and you don't feel conviction anymore. That's when it's scary. Because that means it's done. You're done. You're not going to turn to God because you don't feel it. you'll never feel the, le- the need to do it. But so long as you feel conviction, even though we don't like it, it's a good thing because it tells us that the forgiveness of God is still available, right? Thank you, Jesus. There is hope. There is hope, which is why, again, Shechaniah is telling them, we need to acknowledge our sin. We need to get right, guys. We need to get right. That's what he says, verse 3. Therefore, let us make a covenant. Let us make an agreement with God. To put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Notice, arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Now, it's so interesting. Again, this is going to get touchy tonight, but it's good. The first thing Shechaniah did was to encourage everyone to acknowledge they had sinned. We would say that's the first step, right? That's the first step. We have to acknowledge. If we want God's forgiveness, we need to start by acknowledging, first of all, that we're sinners. We have sinned against God. But it didn't stop there. How many of you know it's not enough to feel guilty? Repentance will cause us to take action. And that's what he tells them. He tells them. Not only should we confess our sins, but we have to rid ourselves of sin, okay? We have to rid ourselves of sin. Now, the interesting thing when it comes to sin is so often too many Christians, I'm going to say too many Christians, want God to get rid of sin for us. Isn't that right? God, if you don't want me to do it anymore, can you take it away from me? That's what we pray. But God has already done his part, hasn't he? He's already provided a way that we could be forgiven. He even promises the strength to enable to overcome if we turn to him. But how many of you know that we have a role to play as well? If you want to change, there's steps we have to take. Look at verse 4. He says, arise. What does arise mean? Get up. For it is your task. This is your job. For we are with you, be strong and, what does he say? Do it. Do it. If you're struggling again with whatever the sin is, we're all different. You have to take a step. Take a step of faith. Stop going to the liquor store, right? Real simple. Whatever it might be, right? We're all different again. I mean, there's so many different sins. You have to take that step. And I think this is so important because this guy, Shek and I, is telling him, confessing it, acknowledging it, that's a great first step. But the next step is you got to cut that stuff loose. 
If you want to stop falling, if you're tired of falling into sin, then get rid of it. Get rid of it. We have to really think about something that I think is really important. If we are serious with God and we seriously want God to forgive us, then we have to get serious about our sin. Isn't that right? Then we have to get serious about our sin. And it means, again, we have to get rid of it. Now, again, I don't know what this is for you. I know what it is for me, but again, we're all different, right? Now, I've talked to, again, so many different people, and I love it, and I, and I like to get real with you guys and share stories because I want you guys to get it. I have talked to people, again, I remember talking to a young man and telling him this. His girlfriend, again, was an unbeliever, and she was leading him away from the Lord. And I told him, dude, it's either God or your girlfriend. It's either God or your girlfriend. And he looked at me, he's like, dude, you're telling me I have to get rid of my girlfriend? That's what he was telling me. He was serious. He said, I can't do it. It's too hard. That, that, God is asking a lot. But I want you to think about what we just read, because again, this is hard. Look at what it says in verse 3, in case you missed it. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children. Shechaniah is telling the people, you got to get rid of those ungodly wives. you got to get rid of them. you got to send them back to their land. These women are going to lead you astray. They're going to cause you eventually to worship false gods. You need to divorce them. Now, that's pretty heavy duty. Was Shechaniah telling them to do something very difficult? Yeah, very, very difficult. Now, I want you to think about this, and I love this. I love this. Remember, every time I study God's word, I hope you do the same thing. Ask questions. Now, how many of you right now at this very second are thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I thought God hates divorce. Does anybody think about that right now? I hope you think about this. Because every time I'm reading God's word and I'm learning God's word again, I'm, I, I'm reconciling because I know God never contradicts himself. And so I read this and I think, wait a minute. How could God use this man, Shechaniah, to tell these Jewish men that they had to divorce their ungodly Wives, that's pretty heavy-duty stuff. Telling them to get rid of them, put them away, send them away. Again, whatever word you want to use, that's what they had to do. Again, if they wanted to get right with God, they had to get rid of their sin. That's heavy-duty. There's a reason. Look back. I'm going to remind you of this verse. Covered it last week. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. God speaking through Moses again. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, speaking of the Israelites, into the promised land, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God gives, you, gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. Remember, they either had to kill these ungodly people or kick them out of the land, okay? You shall make no covenant. Does that include a marriage covenant? Yes. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Notice, you shall not intermarry with them. Is God being crystal clear? Giving your daughters to your their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Why? Verse 4. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then, notice, the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Okay? God warned them. God told them ahead of time. Again, hundreds of years prior to Ezra. Okay? Hundreds of years. But they had to follow God's word. Now, they had broken God's word by covenanting or entering into marriage covenants with these ungodly people. And so now, Shechaniah is telling them to get rid of these women, to get rid of them, which is difficult. Again, we can't even imagine what it would be having to send your wife away 
with your kids. Remember, in those days, the women were always, those kids until the age of 12 were always with the mother. They were, the mother raised them. The mother took care of them. This is the way it worked. And they needed to do this. Why? Well, again, for two very important reasons. One is because they needed to go back to obeying God's word, number one. But two, if they did not get rid of these women, the individual sins of a few would bring destruction upon the whole nation. You guys get that? The individual sins of a few would bring destruction upon the whole nation. And so this was a very important thing to do. As hard as it was, again, this is what was necessary. Now, I want to be crystal clear so no one walks out of here and says, Oh, good, I'm going to go divorce my unsaved husband. Okay, I'm going to be clear about that, okay? This does not apply to us, okay? Let me be crystal clear. This does not apply to us. If you married an unbeliever against, biblically speaking, if you are married to an unbeliever, Biblically, not my words, the Bible. The on, there are only four ways, if you're taking notes, I was going to show you, but I don't want to make this a thing on divorce. There are only four ways you can get out of being with your unbelieving spouse. Number one is disloyalty, right? If they commit adultery. Number two, if they desert you. These are four D's in case you're wondering. Easy to remember. If they are disloyal to you, if they cheat on you, adultery, if they desert you, if they just abandon you. Number three, if they die, duh, right? If they die. (laughs) And number four, if they divorce you, okay? You are not, no Christian is able to file for divorce. Again, it's unbiblical apart from these reasons, right? God expects us to keep our words. There are many times, again, I've counseled couples, and I ask them a very simple question. I say this. Did you say marriage vows to to your spouse? Did you tell your spouse, tell death, do us part? Did you promise them that? And they say, yeah. Then I ask this question. Was God there? And the answer is what? Yeah. Then God heard you. I said, do you expect God to keep his word? Yeah. Well, then God expects you to keep yours. It's real simple. It's the way it works. So again, I want to be crystal clear again. This does not apply to us. Now, why was this so important again to them? Why was this allowed back then? Well, remember, God desired Godly offspring. Why? Because the Messiah was coming. The Messiah was coming. And so this, again, for that very simple reason, again, it, uh, this was only allowed specifically at this time, again, for this people. Divorce was the only way, again, to preserve the nation and ensure a pure line that the Messiah could come through. It does not apply to us. Very important. Verse 5. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. And so they took an oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehonahan, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the Gentiles. Now, I love this because... It tells us here that after Shechaniah said what he said, he encouraged the people to acknowledge they had sinned, to confess before God, and to get rid of their sin, right? To put their wives away. Ezra arises. He gets up. Remember, he had been praying. He gets up and he says, that's right. I second that. That's what he would say. I second that. And I'm calling upon all of you here. That's what he does. I'm calling upon all of you here to take an oath before God. In other words, to promise right now before God. You're weeping. You're broken. But you need to make a decision right now before God that you are going to follow through with what you know needs to be done. Now, why is that important? Well, think about it. How often, especially in church, right? The preacher delivers God's word. People feel conviction. 
the right time for them to respond is when God's speaking to them, right? Not tomorrow or next week or next year. Because by the time they walk out of this church and get right back up and lost and distracted and in the things of this world, they forget about the commitment they made before God. And so Ezra was calling for them to make a commitment right then and there. And then it says, after they swore the oath, he, he left. He went into this guy's house where he would spend time fasting and praying for the rest of the people that he knew were in sin. Verse 7, and a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And that if anyone did not come within three days, by order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited, and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. And so again, what happens? Ezra prays and and he fasts, and the Lord leads him to do this, to send out heralds throughout the land, to issue a proclamation amongst all the people, telling them that in three days, every man needed to come to Jerusalem. We're going to have a meeting, okay? We're going to have a family meeting. Everyone's coming in, okay? Everyone is coming in. Now, back in Ezra 7.26, before he left Babylon, you might remember, King Artaxerxes gave him authority, authority, right, to execute judgment upon who would ever, on, upon whoever would not obey, obey the law of God. And so he had God-given authority. And so he now using, uses this authority to deal with this sin problem. And he's calling everybody. He says, I'm giving you three days. Now, scholars believe that it was three days because most of the people would have lived between 40 and 50 miles away from Jerusalem. Remember, it was mainly the tribes of Benjamin and Judah that returned, and that was within that 50-mile range of Jerusalem. They could have been there within three days, and so he was giving them enough time to come to this special event. Verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month. On the 20th day of the month, and all the people sat in the open square before the house of the Lord, trembling, notice, because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. Okay? And because of the heavy rain. Now, fearing the consequences that Ezra said, everyone shows up. No one flakes out. Everyone is there, okay? It says that when they came, it was the third day, I'm sorry, yeah, it was the 20th day of the ninth month. Now, what does that mean? That, that's a Jewish calendar. When you convert that to our calendar, it is the end of December, beginning of January, okay? Which we call what? Winter. It's the rainy season. So we get this, that he calls them, and the day that they show up, it says here, it's pouring heavy rain. Can you imagine there? The people who are guilty are called to stand before the temple in the open courtyard. They know they've done something wrong. They already feel the guilt, right, and conviction of God's Spirit. And to top it all off, it's pouring rain, okay? Almost a sign of like how God felt about their sin. Verse 10, Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have broken faith and married foreign women and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, right? It's where it begins. Confess your sin to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Number two, separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives, okay? From the foreign wives. And so what do we read here? Again, very important. Take a look at this. With the people standing before them, Ezra once again issues this proclamation. Everyone's there, and he calls on everybody to get right with God. And the way that they needed to get right with God was to do two things. Notice the two things, to confess to the Lord. Remember the word confess means to say the same thing as. That's what the word means. To say the same thing as. Meaning that when we confess to the Lord, we don't make excuses for our sin, right? We don't come up with explanations to God why we did this. 
We simply say the same thing as God says what we did is sin, and we agree with God that he's right. That's what the word confess means, okay? In order to get right with God, this is where it begins, right? God calls them sin, and we must acknowledge that our actions are sinful too. After confession, we then need to separate ourselves just as they were told. Repentance, the word repentance means to change one's mind. That's what the word means, to change one's mind. A lot of times people say repentance means U-turn. That's the idea, but it starts with a change of mind. The literal uh, illustration is a change of mind. So in order to repent, we must not only agree that what we've done is sinful, it's wrong, but we must remove it from our lives by getting rid of it or separating ourselves from it, okay? This is our job. This is what we need to do, right? If there are things that we know that will cause us to sin, we just can't keep them. We can't save them for a rainy day, right? We have to get rid of it. We have to get rid of it. What do I write? If we, although we might stop doing it today, whatever our sin is, if we keep it around us because our flesh is weak, what happens? We will eventually give in to it one day. And so if we mean business, right, it starts with confession to the Lord and leads to separating ourselves, right, from whatever it is that leads us to sin. And this is what Ezra called upon the people to do. Verse 12, then all the assembly answered with a loud voice. It is so. In other words, you are right. We must, if you have a pen, underline must. We must do as you have said. But the people are many. And it is a time of heavy rain, right? It's pouring out here. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two. For we have greatly transgressed in this matter. Let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times. And with them the elders and judges of every city. Until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jeziah, the son of Tikvah, opposed this. And Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levites, supported them. Okay? Supported them. And so basically what happens, basically everyone but four men agreed that they needed to get right. Everyone but four men agreed that they needed to confess their sin and get rid of their foreign wives. But... This was not going to be an easy thing to do, right? It's not something that they could just do right then and there. And so they spoke up and they said, hey, Ezra, we will get right. We are going to do this. We know we must do this. But it can't happen right here, right here and now. It's pouring rain. We can't, we can't handle this matter right now. Give us some time to go back home and to get our affairs in order okay this is what they asked for now what's beautiful and this is will help help us give us that full picture is what the men wanted to do was to go back home and to talk to their wives remember that it was only wrong to marry an ungodly woman woman if she did not reject her gods and turn to jehovah god But the Bible is clear that if a foreign woman or man, right, rejects their gods and embraces the true God, then the marriage is fine. God is good with it, right? We have the story of Ruth, who was a Moabite. She was an ungodly woman who was allowed to marry Boaz, right, a Jewish man, because Ruth believed in the one true God. And so the picture here is that these men tell Ezra, let us do this. Let us go back home. We will meet with our wives, right? We will give our wives an opportunity to repent, to turn to God, to follow after our God, to follow our lead. We will then go before the local judge in our area. And he can can talk to our wives. He can check it out, right? He can make sure that we're doing what we should be doing. If our wives choose to serve the Lord, then everything will be fine. But 
If they refuse to get right with God, then we will send them away. And that's what they were asking again. That's exactly what they were asking. Verse 16. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the police selected men, heads of fathers' houses, according to their fathers' houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. It basically tells us again that it took three months. It took three months for every family, every household, every case to go before the local judge and have the, family, the families examined accordingly. And it says, again, those that had to do it, had to send their wives away, did so, so that it was all done, everything was dealt with, noticed by the first day of the first month. In, or, in other words, they were able to start a new year off right with God. And I love that picture, right? They were able to begin the new year and celebrate the Passover, which happened at the beginning of the year, right with the Lord. All this happened, in case you're wondering, in the year 456 BC. Now let's wrap it up as we look at the last thing. We looked at the sin exposed, the prayer offered, the action taken, and now the offenders listed. Okay? This is how we close tonight. Verse 18. Now there were found some of the sons of the priests who had married foreign women, uh, Messiah, Eleazar, Jerob, uh, Gedaliah, some of the sons of Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak and his brothers. Notice, they pledged themselves to put away their wives and their guilt offering was a ram of the flock for their guilt. Verse 23, we find of the Levites. Verse 24, of the singers, right? Verse 20. For also of the gatekeepers, right? Verse 25, and of the people of Israel. And verse 44 says, all these had married foreign women, and some of them had even born children. This chapter ended, get this, and this is interesting, with 114 men who had to send away their foreign wives. Okay, that's what this list is. Interesting that chapter 2 began with the list of all those people who desired to leave Babylon and serve the Lord. That was like a good list, right? This is a list of those who were guilty, who had sinned against God, right? Who went to their wives, encouraged them to serve the Lord, but their wives would not follow their lead. So they had to get rid of them. They had to send them away again. It wasn't just for them. It was for the sake of all of Israel. Now the sad part, and this is how I close tonight, is in doing so, these men were able to get right with God, right? That's a good thing. But they lost their wives. They lost their wives. That's, think about that. But not only did they lose their wives, think about the impact their divorce had upon their children. Does that make sense? Their children suffered because of their sinful actions, because they refused to obey the Lord the first time. Had they only done what was right, none of this would have ever happened. But again, these are the consequences of sin. I pray again, all of us, myself included, would always be reminded, right, that although sin might be fun, it's never free. Isn't that right? Although sin might be fun, it's never free. I'll end with this. Hopefully you've read this before, but if you haven't, I like it. I think about this quote every once in a while. It says, sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go, keeps you longer than you intended to stay, and costs you more than you plan to pay. That is so true, guys. We think again that we'll get away with sin, that it'll be okay, that somehow it'll all work out. But the reality is, there's always a price to sin. Amen? Let's pray tonight. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, tonight, Lord, for your word. Lord, help us, Lord. Remind us, Lord, of your word that is so true. Lord, remind us of these lessons, Lord, maybe difficult lessons, Lord, but important lessons. This chapter, Lord, shows us again how to get right with you, how to truly repent. 
acknowledging our sin, confessing it before you, and, and getting rid of it, Lord, turning from it. That needs to be our heart, Lord. I pray that, Lord, Lord, not only if there's anyone in here who is an unbeliever or maybe has never made a confession of faith, Lord God, but for all of us, Lord, for your children especially, help us to understand, Lord, if we, if we want your best, if we want your blessing, then it only comes by being serious about sin just like you are. We love you. We thank you. We honor you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.